Hi everyone, I'm Stan Mallow. Welcome to Paranormal Yakker. My guest on today's show is Kevin Randall. I'll be yakking with him about his book, Leverland. It's the first book to examine in detail a series of UFO sightings that took place in and around Leverland, Texas in 1957. Kevin Randall, welcome to Paranormal Yakker. I plan to do a lot of yakking, so thank you very much. You have authored a number of successful books about UFOs. This includes writing about the UFO crash at Roswell and UFOs in the deep state, which I previously interviewed you about. Uh, what was there about the UFO sightings in Leverland that sparked your interest and led you to writing about it? I've thought of the Leverland sightings as maybe the second best case for the extraterrestrial after Roswell, where you've got a craft and bodies. Here is a, a series of sightings that took place over a period of about two, two and a half hours. Witnesses at several different locations independently reported to the sheriff that they'd seen this object close to the ground. It installed their car engines. It had put out their uh, headlights. It had filled their radios with static. Once the UFO was gone, the car was, they were able to start their cars again. Uh, there's an indication, well, the sheriff went out looking for the object. He saw it. And there's an indication that Air Force officers officers were involved in that as well. So we have this series of sightings with multiple witnesses where they interacted with the environment. And there's even a possibility there was a landing trace case involved as well. But because the Air Force and NICAP, the, the, the civil civilian UFO investigators got involved in this fight over the number of witnesses that some of the evidence got overlooked. And there's a good, good case that the Air Force, the government uh, suppressed some of the information. On November 2nd, 1957, two farm workers, a Pedro Sosedo and Joe Salas reported that a glowing egg-shaped craft approached their car, stalling the engine and dimming the headlights. They reported that incident to the Leverland, Texas police. What was the initial response of the police to what they were told? What happened when they called the sheriff's office is, of course, you call the sheriff and say, you know, this giant glowing egg-shaped object came down close to my car and stalled my engine. The first reaction is going to be, well, that didn't happen. You know, you're, you're making it up. You're drunk. There's problems with um, your observation. And when there were subsequent calls that came in, the sheriff finally decided something's going on. I need to talk. I need to go out and look for this thing. They, they got a number of cases and they suddenly realized this is more than just two guys in a pickup truck saying, well, the, this object stalled my car. Now it was it was other people in their vehicles being stalled as well. And if you look at the totality of it, it all began really in Amarillo, Texas, which is way up north in the Texas panhandle with a young couple whose car um, was stalled as they approached the UFO in kind of a fog bag like thing. And when the UFO was gone, they couldn't start the car, had to have it towed into Amarillo and they discovered the battery was fried. So the electromagnetic effect there fried their battery. And I, I bring that up simply because the reaction of the police, well, here's this nice young couple, there's car stalled, they come in and they say, where do I report a UFO? And they're kind of laughing at them. Nobody bothered to get their names. We don't know who they are. Yet there's the police report and the police did go out looking for the object or whatever happened on the highway, but they didn't write down the names of the people. And then a little bit later on, there was another incident placed in Canadian Texas, which is south of Amarillo, but north of Leveland, also in the Texas Panhandle, where the object was seen on the road and had similar um, effects on the uh the witnesses there. So we look at all of that sort of thing. And then we get down to level land. We've got witnesses, I always say at 13 separate locations, independently reporting it. But according to the sheriff, he had received literally dozens of phone calls about this thing. And they didn't write everything down. And we don't have all those names. But the sheriff said there were there were many more phone calls in the level land area. And an hour or so after they stopped in level land, there was sightings at White Sands Missile Range by military police there. And eventually the next day or two days later, James Stokes near Oro Grande. New Mexico, which really isn't all that far from Amor, uh, from Level Land, had a similar experience where his car was stalled, <laughs> and the um, uh, there were other stalled cars along the road as well. He ended up with a light sunburn, and I always think of it now in, in the context of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the movie with Richard Dreyfuss looking out the window when he gets home. He's, his face is partially sunburned, and one arm is sunburned, and his wife is just outraged at this deplorable look of his. But Stokes manifested the same sort of thing: a partial sunburn on part of his face and one of his arms. 
storm that was observed by a number of people before it faded, but it was a very light sunburn. So we have this whole long body of sightings where the UFO is interacting with the environment. There are noticeable effects by the craft, not only the stalling of the car engines, but the destruction of the battery, the burning of, of Stokes, that would have led us to a whole different conversation if the Air Force hadn't been so busy attempting to uh, belittle and dismiss the sightings and explain them in a ridiculous fashion. We could have we could have known a lot more about what was going on, but that's not what happened. In a two-hour period after Pedro and Joe saw the craft they reported to the police, many others independently reported the same thing, the close approach of a glowing object that affected the operation of their cars. That motivated the Hockley County uh, Sheriff to search for the UFO. He found it. How did he describe what he saw. Well, we should point out, of course, that Level Land is Hockley, in Hockley County. <laughs> For those of you who are not familiar with the counties of Texas, but uh, what happened after he'd gotten a number of phone calls, he decided I should go out and see what's going on out here because there's an awful lot of people and uh, talking about this. And it was on a, a highway that's just north of Level Land. I've actually driven down that highway, so I, I understand the geography of the situation. So he was out there. Apparently, he drove out with a deputy in his car. Behind him was another car with the state police in it. I think they call it the Texas Department of Public Safety. I don't know if that was the name of it in 1957. That's the name of it now. And then there was a third car with Air Force officers in it. So we've got this convoy looking for it. In the uh, Air Force report, they say, well, the sheriff saw something, a red streak in the distance. Nothing happened inside for two seconds. Prior to the Air Force investigation, the sheriff had given a, a number of reporters a description of what he'd seen. And he talked about an oval-shaped object or something that was maybe football-shaped, something like that. But he saw an actual object uh, glowing bright red. The next day, he went to his the police mechanic and had his car checked. And you have to ask yourself, why would you do that if your car hadn't stalled? Well, what that's telling us is his car stalled and he wanted to make sure there was not a mechanical problem with the car that would have caused it to cut out at that time. But if his car cut out, so did the car behind him and the, and the third car carrying the Air Force officers. So now we have a very good case. The sheriff said he was much closer. Once the Air Force investigation begins officially, and that was with the fellow coming down from Ent Air Force Base in Colorado Springs. Springs, uh, who spent a whole seven hours investigating this case, a guy named uh, Norman Barth. He was a staff sergeant. Uh, after that happened, and the FBI apparently was involved, the sheriff's story became a little bit more vague. And that, and we have the Air Force report saying, well, it was in the distance. And that was how he kind of kept it for a while. In 1974, I'm not sure the date that he was interviewed. I know the date of the article that came out in UFO, uh, official UFO, which is a UFO magazine from the mid-1970s, early 1980s. Uh, there was a report, I think it's the 1970s, 76, one of the 1976 issues written by Don Berliner, who interviewed the sheriff, the Hockley County Sheriff, who told him again that he got much closer and that he saw the, the object. So we have the sheriff saying, well, I saw an object. I got very close to it. The Air Force shows up and the story changes. And once the sheriff is no longer sheriff and it's 20 years later, he says, yes, I got very close to it. And I uh, uh, saw an object as opposed to that. So the Air Force investigation was uh, to explain it as quickly as possible but without doing a good investigation. What I find strange is I found very little about the Air Force officers involved. I found reference to them. I can document that there were Air Force officers involved. And in fact, the next day, which would have been November 3rd, I think it was a Sunday, um, the sheriff and the provost marshal from Reese Air Force Base, Reese Air Force being in Level Land, uh, in Lubbock, Texas, I should say, which is about 20 minutes from Level Land. But officers from uh, Reese Air Force Base were with the sheriff in that convoy. But there's very little documentation about what they'd seen. And I'm thinking that Barth came down from Ent Air Force Base. He knew about what had transpired that night, and he knew that there were Air Force officers involved, but there's no mention of them in the Air, in the Air Force file. And I find that very curious, and I find it very, very important, simply because it tells us a little bit about the Air Force investigation and the fact that not everything got into the Project Blue Book files, because here clearly are people that Barth would have wanted to, inv uh, to interview because they saw the object and they were with the sheriff when he had his problems with the close approach of the UFO. They knew what was going on as well, but you can find almost no reference to the Air Force officers involved. The Leverland sightings were not the first in which electromagnetic energy effects were reported. As far back as 1909, a motorcycle rider reported such an incident. How did he describe what he saw passing over 
and and how was his motorcycle affected? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I think Mark Rodiker did a, a book, a, a survey of, of electromagnetic effects and, and vehicle, vehicle interference. And he talks about the 1909 sighting in England. And he says the guy was riding his motorcycle, saw an object in a field close by. And as he approached it, the headlight of his motorcycle went out and the object eventually took off and the headlight came back on. I mean, that's not a big, impressive thing going on. And it's 1909. So it's, it's lucky that we actually know about that case. As we move forward in time, we see similar type things rarely reported. Len Stringfield, who was a uh, um, pretty famous ufologist and was responsible for creating the term crash retrievals and kind of opened up this field of looking at the possibility of UFO crashes and recovery of their material. Len Stringfield reported that when he was in the army as an intelligence officer, he was on his way to uh, Okinawa. And I believe they were near o uh, Iwo Jima, they were near Okinawa, and they were in a, a C-47, which is a twin engine aircraft. And one of the engines began to sputter. And then the other engine began to sputter. And he looked outside and saw three objects approaching the airplane. And the, the pilot says, you know, prepare to ditch. We're, we're going down into the ocean because the engines are cutting out. And the objects moved away. And of course, the engines picked back up again, and they were able to continue their journey without having to ditch. In 1947, right after Kenneth Arnold made his sighting near Mount Rainier, Washington, a fellow named Fred Johnson near uh, Mount Adams, Washington, couldn't describe himself as an old time prospector, said as these objects approached him, the compasses, his compass began to spin wildly. And that is an indication of an electromagnetic effect. There's a fellow named um, uh, Eric Herr who collected, I believe, something like 140 cases of compass interference, uh, which of course suggests an electromagnetic effect. So we've got various times of uh, these effects being manifested themselves. We have documentation about this. We have the interaction with the environment and the effect the instruments that way as well. In fact, uh, Fred, not Fred, um, Fran Ridge at NICAP has what he calls his MADAR system. And that's based on this idea that there's emissions by the UFOs that can be detected by various centers. And he has nodes all around the world now, not as many as he'd like. And they're having a having an issue now with a, a minor glitch in the software. But the idea is if a UFO approaches close to one of these nodes, one of these MADAR centers, it will trigger a response. And then they comb through UFO sighting reports to see if there's some kind of sighting close by that would explain that. So they're looking for correlations. And there's also a suggestion that the node operator, when he hears the alarm go off, go outside and look for it and take his camera and photograph it. And I suggested, and I think Fran probably thought of it before I suggested it, that he uh, have a number of friends in the area to alert them so you could have multiple photographs of this object. And we could gather an awful lot of important data from multiple photographs from, from one of these alerts on a node center. So the idea that these electromagnetic effects exist has been pretty well accepted in the UFO community for literally decades. And the idea that we can use that to detect the UFOs and maybe gather additional information without having to involve the human entities, or we can use completely the, the instrumentality. I love that word instrumentality of of the node center to gather the data as well, because then you have to have the uh, humans to interpret the data. And that's kind of where Av Avi Loeb is. He is the Harvard astronomer who is setting up the Galileo project. They're using, uh, they're, they're suggesting they would set up a number of areas around the world to attack detect uh, these alien objects coming into the solar system. And I, I, I hesitate using the term alien. They're not necessarily artificial. Uh, they could be just some kind of a natural phenomenon that comes from outside the solar system and passes through the solar system. It's just happened uh, a couple of years ago, which kind of sparked their interest, but it, it's that kind of thing. So we're, we're moving to a, an arena where science is beginning to look at ways to scientifically look at uh, the UFOs or gather the information without human participation. The uh, major our system is set up in kind of the same way. And we have uh, these stories of these electromagnetic effects starting, not starting with, but but kind of uh, emphasized by the level land sightings and all of those sightings that took place in the desert Southwest in November of 1957. In level land, you cover the whole spectrum of electromagnetic uh, effects with the emphasis on those sightings in the American uh, Southwest in the fall of 1957, as you just mentioned. And you demonstrate how the air 
Force failed uh, in their mission, what were their failures? The Air Force mission is to keep alien artifacts uh, out of our, our skies. Their, their mission is to protect our skies. And it doesn't matter what those alien artifacts may be, whether they happen to be at the time it would have been Soviet, our competitors in the world, spy uh, planes, spy drones now, that sort of thing. Their mission is to keep our skies clear and safe. And one of the problems they have is we've got UFOs. Well, they're not paying any attention to uh, the FAA or our laws. And their job is to investigate. In fact, in 1957, they were managed mandated to investigate these sightings. And as, as I mentioned, the, the investigation took place in seven hours. How can you possibly investigate the number of sightings in seven hours? You've got, I guess, witnesses at 13 locations. The sheriff knows of other witnesses. You've got law enforcement involved. You've got your own Air Force officers involved. And there was a report of a landing trace north of, I believe it was north of Level Land on one of the ranches there that the sheriff went out and he looked at. Um, the, the provost marshal didn't go with him at that at that time. A fellow named Don Burlinson from, from interesting Roswell, New Mexico, which is about two and a half, three hours away from Level End, by the way, had investigated the case uh, around 2000. He talked to the widow of the sheriff. He talked to his daughter and they mentioned this landing trace. And uh, Burlinson went out and talked to the uh, ranch where it was found and talked to the, the people who'd seen it. So we not only have the sheriff talking about this burned area, we have corroboration from testimony of people, firsthand testimony. We have the secondhand testimony from the sheriff and firsthand testimony. So had we gathered all that data there at that time, and you couldn't do that in seven hours, and there's no indication they made any follow-up investigations. And in fact, you read the documentation in the Project Blue Book files, it says right in there that they are waiting for NICAP, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena Research, a civilian research organization, to make their statement so the Air Force can respond to it. The Air Force is going to make a statement because they feel it's easier to respond to something like that. And then they say, well, only three people saw the object. Well, I can point to their own file where there's names of five people who saw the object. So it kind of negates that. Kehoe at NICAP said there were nine witnesses to the object. I know 13. So uh, they got so bogged down in this argument over the number of witnesses that they diverted the conversation until the interest waned on this particular sighting, this clump of sightings, and uh, people went on about their business from that point on. And it just kind of gets lost in the shuffle of what else is going on in the world of UFOs. But the Air Force attitude in 1957 was to explain it. They didn't care how they explained it, just explain it. And they came up with this idea that it was ball lightning. Well, in 1957, science wasn't even sure that ball lightning existed. And there's still a controversy about the, the legitimacy of ball lightning, that it may be some other phenomenon. But the point is they were making, they were using a phenomenon that was not understood by science and that was controversial to explain another uh, set of circumstances that was not explainable by science. And it was certainly was uh, controversial. If you look at the Project Blue Book files today, they have the sighting listed as ball lightning. Ball lightning is a, I think it's a very rare phenomenon because you don't have a lot of sightings and it's still controversial, but it's something that's about 18 inches, 24 inches, you know, foot and a half to two feet in diameter and very short live. There are no reports that I know of, and I looked for them when I was doing the, the work on the book, of a ball lightning stalling a car engine. And now we have a situation where the car engines were stalled all over uh, the level land Texas area and panhandle of Texas over a period of hours. Well, ball lightning couldn't do that. With the Pedro Sacito sighting, they said, well, uh, the car was taken to the mechanic the next day and they found a little bit of uh, metal in the distributor. So they think he maybe that shorted out the engine and caused it to stall. And I think, well, that would be a wonderful explanation, but you don't explain that how after it stalled the engine, he was able to start it again and why he, it didn't manifest itself other time. And if he was alone in this and his was the only car that stalled and he was the only one to report the UFO, you could say, well, yeah, it's probably one of those things, strange things, but we have all these other people doing, having the same observations and having the same experience. And now suddenly you're stretching the coincidence to credulity. You just cannot believe that uh, uh, Ball lightning would do this, and and uh, the broken distributor on Pedro Cicero's truck would have initiated the whole hysteria. The other thing I should point out, because I know a lot of people are in, in the world today in social media, if your car was stalled by a UFO, you'd be on your cell phone the moment you could get access to your cell phone to work and telling everybody about it and everybody would be out looking for it and you'd be having pictures taken and all of this stuff going on. But in 1957, you didn't have that. You didn't have a phone you could carry in your pocket to alert people. You didn't have Tic Tac and you didn't have Facebook and you didn't have Instagram. And so when, after Saucedo got his truck started again, he was so frightened, he didn't drive to Level 
land. He went to a different town so he could call the sheriff and tell him what he had, what he had seen. And so there was no way that the rest of Level Land would know what Pedro Saucedo had called into the sheriff's office. So you don't expect everybody to be out looking for the for the UFO. So you have these independent witnesses, and it'd be much harder to build an independent case today with our uh, instant connections with one another. Kevin, you have discovered new evidence about the Air Force participation in the secret investigation. Level Land proves that the Air Force investigation was a sham controlled by the government to conceal the true nature of the UFO phenomenon. Uh, could you elaborate on that? Well, I did this, as you know, I, I did a book, UFOs in the Deep State. And the question has always been, why doesn't the government tell us the truth now? I mean, we're more sophisticated. We're used to the idea. It's, most of us grown up in a time when they're flying saucers. I mean, I'm young enough to, to have uh, uh, not been involved with the very first sightings in July of 1947. So we've all grown up with this idea. There's been hundreds of movies and TV programs, and there's uh, there's the Star Trek, there's the Star Wars. We're all kind of used to this idea. We're much more sophisticated. We understand the science much better. So why couldn't they say, well, there's we, we've been visited by alien creatures, and it's really no big deal. They have not affected our society in any way. They seem to be benign. We're, we're no indications that it's going to be Independence Day around here or anything like that. And, and that's always been the question. Why won't they tell us? And I think it boils down to the deep state. And I think it boils down to the fact that the deep state is has two missions in its life. One, to retain its power and two, to gain great financial reward from being involved in the deep state. And we look at the way our government works. Sure, you get a new president every four years or every eight years, depending on the cycles or whatever is going on. And they come in and appoint people to the secretarial or the, 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 the cabinet and things like that. So the upper, the very, very tip top is uh, appointees and government uh, officials. But the bureaucrats underneath them that last forever in high ranking places are able to control and manipulate the situation. In the deep state, I, I'd always said, I'd always said that if I'm the president and I want to find out about UFOs, I go to my director of central intelligence or the director of national intelligence. And I say, tell me about flying saucers. Tell me about UFO. And he says, well, I can't tell you, Mr. President, it's too highly classified. My next response says, you're fired, bring your deputy. And I could get to the information. But I find out that they can manipulate the situation to prevent that. Um, Jimmy Carter, when he came in, was going to find out about UFOs. And he met with his director of central intelligence, George W. Bush. And this is this is while Carter was still president-elect. And they're discussing the UFOs. And Carter brings up the UFOs. And Bush says to him, I would like to remain on as the director of central intelligence once you uh, are inaugurated. And Carter says, I'm bringing in my own guy. And Bush says, well, I can't tell you, you're not the president yet, and uh, you don't have the need to know. And so Bush stalled him at that point. And then you have to say, well, when he got his own guy in, why couldn't he get the answer? And I think the answer is when the president says, I would like to know what you have on UFOs, the answer is going to be, that's a very complex question. And there's a number of various agencies that are involved in this, and we need to discuss it. I will pull together a comprehensive report for you, and we'll get it to you soon. And they never get it to him. And we saw a prime example of this just recently when uh, Congress got interested in UFOs, and there was going to be a big congressional meeting on June 25th of, of last year, and they were going to issue a report from the Director of National Intelligence, and what did we get? We, we heard there were 144 reports. What does that mean? Was there like 50 different incidents and and a number of people reported on the same thing. Were there 25? Um, how does that all work? I always graded it as a C. I always said C minus high school report, but I'm thinking more of a D plus now. And they said, what we're going to do is we'll come back. Uh, you, you, you got, you've got 90 days to bring us a new report. Well, the 90 days expired on October 25th, and we didn't hear a single word. And now where are we? Well, Congress has mandated that they're going to have to set up an office to investigate these sorts of things, but they're limiting to military uh, reports, not civilian reports, not airline reports, military reports, because they can bring down the mantle of national security on that. Well, we can't get too deep into this because we were using classified methodology. We were using classified equipment to gather the information. These, these people can't talk about it. And suddenly we're no further along than we than we have been. And this is what we saw in 1947 when uh, General Twining said, well, the flying saucers are something real, but they're not visionary or uh, illusionary or fictitious. Um, and we need to investigate this and we need to set up an office and do a classified investigation. And what happened? Eventually, it became a public relations outfit with the purpose of debunking UFOs, and we didn't get anywhere. Now, here we are in 2022, and we're at the same point we were 75 years ago. You have included in your book the latest findings about the UFO sightings in Leveland, Texas, and a number of new witnesses to the event. What are these latest findings? Who are these new witnesses? Uh, what did they say? 
And what reasons did they give for not coming forward earlier? One of the things we we can look at is the electromagnetic effects are not limited to Leveland, Texas in November of 1957. In, in the book, we go up, we go up, I go up into uh, the 21st century and talking about it. And what we see there is the idea of animals reacting to the close approach of UFOs, which is not a, a new phenomenon. There's many, many reports of that throughout UFO history. But it's also looking at people who um, were involved in the Leveland sightings, uh, telling us a little bit more about what they had seen and what they had done. There was a point where uh, there was a four MPs at uh, um, White Sands Missile Range. I don't know why I couldn't think of White Sands Missile Range there. Who had reported this thing? Two of the MPs reported it within uh, an hour or so of the sightings ending ending in level man. The other two reported it later in the day when their shift came on. The Air Force interviewed these guys and said, well, they were young soldiers. They weren't very well trained and they were caught up in the hysteria of the time. And I'm thinking, well, the first two couldn't have been caught up in the hysteria because they didn't know about it. And they reported the object coming down and they could see it silhouetted against the mountains behind them. So it was clearly not up in the sky. It was much, much closer to the ground. And the Air Force was saying, you know, they were young guys. They were 20, 21 years old. And I'm thinking I was 19 years old as a helicopter pilot and aircraft commander in Vietnam, the military puts great amount of responsibility into very young soldiers. And so that's no reason to dis dismiss their observations. The other thing that was curious about that, and I talked to Glenn Toy, who was one of the soldiers. So I know how his report differs from what the Air Force said and how they kind of maligned that. He would made it very clear to me that he was 50 yards or 100 yards away from this thing when it came down very close to the ground. And the Air Force was saying, well, they observed the moon. Well, as far as I know, the moon has never gotten that close to the ground. And if it did, there would be all kinds of environmental problems <laughs> if you got the moon that close to the ground. The second group of MPs, the yeah, second two MPs, they said, well, they saw Venus. And you can argue they were caught up in the hysteria of the time because by the time they were out on patrol, they'd already talked to their fellow MPs, Glenn Toy being among them. So they knew that about the UFO sightings at the White Sands Missile Range. So you could argue that point, but you can't argue it with the first two. The other interesting thing is of the four MPs involved in this, uh, only three of them were interviewed. The fourth was on a three-day pass. I'm thinking, why? And if he's on a three-day pass, then how come the Air Force couldn't get in touch with him after he returned from has passed because once again, um, Reese Air Force Base is not that far from White Sands, or you could brought him up from one of the other military installations around um, the White Sands. Uh, Helloman Air Force Base is, you know, <laughs> right next door to White Sands. You could have had somebody from, from there come out and talk about it. And the idea is one of the one of the MPs manifested the same kind of a burn that um, James Stokes, who uh, was, was involved later on, and he was in the hospital. And so they couldn't interview the guy in the hospital because that would be an admission that whatever happened was of significance that he had to go to the hospital. So we just ignore that guy when we, we belittle and malign the other three guys. With James Stokes, who was the man that was burned near Oro Grande, New Mexico on the 4th of, of November, when his car was stalled and a number of other cars were stalled, um, he was described as an engineer and the Air Force in their rebuttal said, no, he wasn't an engineer. He had no training as an engineer. James Stokes was at least a 20-year veteran of the Navy. He, he'd risen to very high enlisted rank in the Navy. And his job was described, Holloman Air Force Base, White, or been Alamogordo Air Force Base, uh, Air, Army Airfield at the time, later uh, Holloman Air Force Base. As an engineer, he had an engineering position and you had his boss and a number of air, other Air Force officers, military officers, defending him as an engineer, calling, well, he's working as an engineer. He's been trained as an engineer, maybe not formally in college, but certainly on the job with the Navy and all of this sort of thing. And so you see how they're trying to smear him as well. He wasn't an engineer and he's lying about, he's embellished his resume. And the first thing he did was he went to the media and that's not true. He'd actually called his boss and said, I've had this experience. Is it okay? I talk about it. And his boss said, uh, you didn't happen. It didn't happen on Air Force time. So go right ahead. And he told, called his friend, Jim Lorenzen, who was the head of APRO, him and uh, Coral Lorenzen had started the Aero Phenomena Research Organization. They lived in Alamogordo. So they knew James Stokes and he talked to them and they took him to the radio station. So the first thing he did was not go to the to the media. The first thing he did was call his boss. And the th second thing he did was report his UFO sighting to his friends who are interested in UFO sighting. So you see the Air Force attempting to um, divert attention away from the, from the sightings by uh, dismissing the witnesses as being young, incompetent, embellishing their resume 
amazed, not sure of what they'd seen. So there you go. It seems that um, not just the government has been covering up the existence of UFOs, but segments of the media has also been doing that. So that means they are either in collusion uh, with each other or the media has chosen on its own to not believe in alien visitations. Uh, I'm curious to know, what's your take on the media-government relationship? I think we've seen great examples of that recently, where the government's interacting with at least part of the uh, the governmental employees, the government, the elected officials. Um, but I think when we take a look at things that went on back in 1947, when flying saucers first burst into the scene, there was a great deal of interest in what was going on. And there seems to be the military not really sure what's happening. And they're trying to figure this whole thing out. But one of the first headlines you read in 1947, in July of 1947, is flying saucers now seen in 38 states except Kansas. Well, the gag was Kansas was a dry state, which means you couldn't buy alcoholic beverages legally in Kansas. So they're implying they're drunk. After July 8th of 1947, this is the date that the um, fellows at Roswell, Colonel Blanchard, announced that they had caught, they'd captured a flying saucer. The next day, the Army and the Navy began their attempts to suppress the information. And part of that in suppression was kind of ridiculing the witnesses for being uneducated, unsophisticated, drunk, uh, all of those sorts of things. And I think what you ended up with was a news media wanting to prove that they were much more sophisticated than the general public. And they're not going to believe in flying saucers for crying out loud. And I think that is really what was going on there. Don Schmidt and I had an appointment to speak with um, reporters at, uh, I think it was Chicago Tribune when we had gotten in deep into the, the Roswell investigation. This was in, in 1990, 1991. And so we were, we went to the, the newspaper headquarters. We were met in the hallway by an intern. She conducted the interview. We weren't even allowed into the city room or an office. They, she conducted the interview in a hallway and she told us that the editors just didn't believe these sorts of things. And I'm thinking, then why did we waste our time coming down here to talk to you? I mean, I don't mind talking to anybody about UFOs and, and I'm not belittling her, but she was an intern and we couldn't even get into the main part of the, the newspaper office because of the attitudes of the other editors and other reporters. They were too sophisticated to believe in UFO. We've seen a, a, a change, a minor change in that more recently, especially after the Navy Tic Tac videos were released. But we still get that sort of thing, that sort of uh, ridicule factor coming down because um, the news media simply does not want to be seen as unsophisticated. And I also think there's there's a level of, of pressure. Uh, if you go back and you look at the history of the investigations, you can see the pressure brought by the military brought by the government to get things pushed in their own direction. And in Washington, D.C., contacts are everything. Sources are everything. And uh, you go against the source or you burn a source, then you never have that source again. And that could come back to haunt you. So you're very careful on how you treat this stuff. So if the Air Force says to you, well, you know, that's not a story we really want to pursue right now. Let's go somewhere else. An awful lot of times the reporters are going to say, OK, uh, let's talk about something else and to keep the sources alive. So I think it's a combination of those sorts of things. I think I think the, the collusion with the, the media is more, um, not quite as uh, um, well-defined as it is in some other areas, but I think they, the links can be be drawn by careful reading of the documents. The Condon Committee, which was the Air Force investigation through the University of Colorado in the late 1960s, we now have the letters that were exchanged between the Condon Committee uh, scientists and the Air Force, a fellow named Robert Hippler, and I, I, and, and I have the Hippler letter on my blog, telling the Condon Committee, before they even start, here's what we'd like you to find. We'd like you to find that there's no uh, threat to national security. We would like you to say there's, the Air Force has done a good job in investigating the UFOs, and there is no scientific value in continuing the investigation. Condon, in a, a, a presentation given in Corning, New York, some months later, said to the assembled audience um, that uh, he's just ready to, to answer the questions now. There's really nothing to it, but he's not supposed to find that answer for another 18 months. Well, what kind of scientific investigation are you conducting when you know what the answer is? Now, I you know, I've taken some scientific courses. I studied astronomy under Van Allen. I, I always say that, but Van Allen was the chairman of the Department of Astronomy at the um, University of Iowa when I took astronomy courses there. He actually came in and lectured once or twice, and I had an opportunity to talk to him about flying saucer. But the, the point simply is, uh, you, you have to take a look at all of how this thing is assembled, and the, Condon, the way the Condon Committee uh, gathered their data... It, 
without um, a thought to what really was going on. Leveland, for example, is mentioned one time in the Condon Committee's report, and it's kind of to dismiss it because they couldn't do any, any investigation. It's only 10 years later you could have gotten there. But in the end, the Condon Committee found exactly what the Air Force told them to find. There was no national security implications, and they knew that was a lie because one of their one of their scientists had been turned away from an investigation in Belt, Montana, about a UFO that had, had uh, shut down a flight of uh, ICBMs, which you're not supposed to be able to do from outside. It's just supposedly impossible to do, and they had able to do it. That became an issue of national security. So when they said there are no national in security implications to UFO studies, that was a blatant lie, and they knew it. So we look at all of that, how it has been treated from that from the very inception to where we are today. We're getting a little bit more serious, but I have grave reservations about what's going to happen because of the caveats put on the investigation that they're, they're setting up now and the way they handled the report due to Congress uh, just last June. Should viewers of Paranormal Yacker want to buy your book, Level Land, or any of your other books, uh, Kevin, how can they do that? Very simple. Amazon.com. Uh, it, just type in Kevin Randall in it. I think it's now the first book that comes up under my name. It's there and my other books are there, including the UFOs in the Deep State, which we b- touched on briefly. Uh, the Socorro UFO Landing, which is called Encounters in the Desert and Roswell in the 21st Century. So, And, and other books that are much, much older than that. Um, so all of that stuff is on Amazon.com and if you like the book, give it a rating. And sometimes even if you don't like the book, but you have a good reason for not liking the book. Um, that That's fine too. I, I had to laugh at one of the reviews somebody wrote. He, he gave it a poor rating because there weren't enough pictures in the books. And I'm thinking, pictures in a book? What is this, comic books here? You know, uh, 20 years ago, it was difficult to get pictures in books. And now the technology has changed so you can put pictures on every page and it's not a big deal. But uh, I, I thought that was not really a fair criticism of the book. Look at the information. Look at the data. If you want to argue with the data, that's fine with me. But uh, but but the, the stuff is available online and in your bookstores and everywhere you care to go. Great. Uh, Kevin Randall, I thank you for being my guest on Paranormal Yacker. I wish you the same success with Leverland as you've had with previous books you've written. Well, thank you so much. And I always enjoy appearing on the Yacker because I love the opportunity to yak. And I love to yak with you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yacker. I hope you enjoyed the interview you just watched. To be sure you don't miss any interviews on my free YouTube channel, all you have to do is press the subscribe button on your screen.